Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Welcome to the E-Institute's webinar series focusing on climate change action. The goal of this webinar series is to provide a forum for leading experts, policymakers, and private sector and others to discuss timely topics on low emissions development planning and financing, capacity for sustainable energy, and also climate smart agriculture in landscape management. While these webinars are targeted largely towards policymakers and practitioners, everyone is really welcome to attend. It's um, virtual, so if you have access to the internet and have the time, uh, we very much look forward to your attendance. Today we have a very interesting agenda planned. We have with us Nathan Hultman, Associate Professor and Director of Environmental and Energy Policy Programs at the School of Public Policy, University of Maryland. During this webinar, Nathan will discuss the importance of innovation in the energy sector and how innovation policies can support a transition towards low carbon economy. Among his many accomplishments, Nathan is a non-resident fellow at the Brookings Institute and also associate professor of the Joint Global Change Research Institute. Um, Dr. Hultman's expertise is in the area of international climate policy, energy technologies, and private sector decisions to undertake low carbon investments. Before we get started with this interesting session, uh, let me ask those of you who have not already done so to um, sign up in the chat window, your name, your email, your organization. And so we'll give you about one minute to do so and then um, without much ado, turn it over to Dr. Nathan Hultman. Okay, well, uh, and uh, speaking uh, with you all this, this morning, this afternoon, or this evening, wherever it may be. Um, today's agenda is to look uh, at what the role of innovation is in developing national or even subnational policies to address low emissions development. Um, the question always arises is why do we why are we concerned about green growth or green policy and why are we concerned about innovation? What do the two have to do with each other? Uh, wouldn't it be fine just to do uh, standard regulations to address our environmental issues and then think about economic policy differently. And the response to that is that integrating these two approaches to energy is actually a way that we can imagine solving a number of different development problems simultaneously. And that's what I'd like to talk with you all about today. For some of the motivation here, uh, I'm going to refer to one of the, the headline dimensions of the recent Rio Plus 20 meeting in Rio de Janeiro, uh, 20 years after the first Rio meeting, which articulated a vision of the next, next stage of sustainable development, where we're imagining sustainable development not simply as a, a way to control sort of our resource, resource use and ensure that there's good development without using too much resource, but rather in recasting that and embracing development as an economic agenda, but building in energy, environmental health. So as, as this quote says, uh, sustainable development emphasizes in the words of the conference organizer, or the, the, the uh, outcomes document, a holistic, equitable, and far-sighted approach to decision making. Um, and the idea that the, the, the integration, as you can see there, it rests on the integration and balanced consideration of social, economic, and environmental goals and objectives in both public and private decision making. And what I'm going to talk about today is a way that we can imagine via policy, via stakeholder engagement at the national or subnational levels, incorporating this idea of growth and innovation as part of the development agenda. Okay, here's one of the, the challenges uh, in some ways of, of thinking about this new approach to sustainable development. We are con consistently uh, always looking for ways to decouple environmental impacts from economic growth. And by, by decoupling, I, I simply mean to en enable the economy to grow, to enable uh, services, whether they're lighting services, energy services, transportation services, to be more widely available and available in higher quantities 
without the kinds of environmental impacts that we've seen uh, from the existing energy infrastructure. Um, and what, I've shown, what I'm showing here is uh, trends in, in the OECD um, showing GDP, that's the top curve there that you can see in the, in the figure, um, as well as municipal waste generation, energy supply, non-energy material consumption, and greenhouse gas emissions. And the interesting thing here, of course, is that GDP, uh, with the, with, you, know, you can see there's a slight dip in, uh, with the global economic crisis of the last few years. But for the most part, GDP has grown substantially faster than all of these other essentially environmental, uh, uh, the, the, the burdens of the economy from, from the operation of the economy uh, in municipal waste, energy supply, uh, material consumption in greenhouse gases. And it's that kind of decoupling, that kind of moving away from a lockstep where we expand GDP only by expanding energy supply. Um, that's where the green growth and innovation uh, agenda lies. So here are just four ways that, that we can imagine this might happen uh, over the coming decade or two decades. Now there's different kinds of innovation. We'll talk about that in the rest of, in other parts of, of the seminar today. Um, but broadly speaking, some of the most um, near-term useful kinds of innovations are new and perhaps cheap applications of existing technologies, taking ideas that already exist out in the public domain, repackaging them for a, locally, uh, for a local context, and then being able to market those technologies to a, essentially a wide, perhaps lower margin, but a, a, wide, uh, a, a wide array of, of uh, uh, consumers. Um, I, is one example there, and I'll, I'll talk about this later, but the flex fuel vehicle, flex fuel car, which can burn ethanol or gasoline. The technology existed for uh, 60 or 70 years before it actually what entered into, into widespread use. The place that it entered into widespread use was Brazil. Brazil had an existing ethanol infrastructure. They were able to take the flex fuel vehicle technology, um, bring it to market, and there was uh, essentially a, a widespread market uptake and uh, huge success to the point where in the span of seven or eight years, uh, the quantity of flex fuel vehicles uh, increased from 0% in a roughly 2003 to above 90% today. Um, using old ideas in a new context, uh, integrating several existing technologies to serve an, under, an undertapped market, or even using new business models to provide services, business models that might, in fact, be enabled by new applications of information technology or distributed um, uh, uh, phone use or something like this. Here's one example of a repackaging of existing technologies for, for a particular goal. Um, LEDs, light emitting diodes, are a very low energy form, uh, a way to produce light. Uh, they're more efficient than even compact fluorescence, uh, probably about 10 times more efficient than our standard incandescent lights that existed you know, 20 or 30 years ago. And one of the, uh, the ideas with this uh, particular technology that you're looking at on your screen is that by repackaging LEDs with a, a very inexpensive solar recharge, very inexpensive battery in a robust and very durable package, you could actually make a rechargeable lighting source that could be distributed out into rural areas that were in fact off grid, with didn't have a lot of uh, existing electricity supply infrastructure and bring lighting services to places that didn't have them already. Uh, this would be, you know, Areas around the world, uh, populations that essentially would not have access to light after dark. This is, you know, very helpful for for something like development outcomes uh, on education, um, and uh, and and so on. So that's one example. And here I'm going to give you another example. Often when we think about innovation, uh, I gave you the example of the repackaging of existing technologies. Here's an example um, that is a business model example. Uh, as we know, certain kinds of technologies are highly advanced, and those kinds of technologies tend to be very expensive in the early stages. There are a couple of kind of business models that can be used to advance the, the, the kind of cutting edge technology. Uh, one of them I, I show here, which is on the left. This is the Tesla Roadster. The Tesla is a very advanced uh, battery electric vehicle. It's very high tech. It uses uh, the, most, the more advanced battery technology. It's generally high cost, and it targets a small and essentially rich market. They're targeting very high margin consumers, very high wealthy consumers, like the guy you see driving the vehicle there. Um, uh, basically, the, car, the, car, the cars are extremely expensive, and their business model is that they want to sell a few very expensive cars 
and use that to build out their technology to the point where they can bring down costs, make it increasingly accessible to a lower and lower income bracket users. So they're starting at the top and they're working down. Um, there's another approach, though, to doing uh, technology innovation, uh, thinking about batteries. Here's, this is a picture of uh, some of you may be uh, intimately familiar with, but in some parts of the world, not Washington, D.C. right now where I'm sitting, but in some parts of the world, electric scooters are, in fact, one of the, the fastest growing modes of transportation. Electric scooters that are not using the most advanced batteries, they're not targeting the highest margin customers. They're essentially targeting people that is, need to get to work and that the, the cleanliness of the product is essentially a, almost a byproduct of the fact that it gets you from here to there in a relatively inexpensive way. Now, these electric vehicles um, are using relatively old technology. They're repackaging old technology, and they're pioneering uh, dimensions of battery recharge systems. So basically, the question is, how do you recharge a battery? Do you actually plug it in and let it sit for six hours, or do you swap it out with a substitute? And these electric scooters are actually pioneering this alternate business model of essentially renting batteries or swapping out recharged batteries. It's a new model that hadn't been used before, but this is the kind of uh, innovation. Uh, I think we need to label it as an innovation that is something that can drive technological change. Because the question is, which of these two will push battery technology forward? And the answer is they both do, right? One of them pushes technology forward at the very high end. The other is very effective at, at, at addressing a large number of people, hundreds of thousands, potentially millions of customers, pushing the costs of that technology down for the, the kind of more, more general use. Um, another question arises with innovation is that sometimes we think about innovation being something with a very long-term payoff. And if you think about innovation in both of these ways, there is, it is true that Tesla is an interesting model and may provide a new kind of inexpensive and perhaps technically superior battery down the road in five or ten years, uh, maybe 15 years for, for general use. Um, but the one that's providing benefits now is the lower cost one. It's the repackaged system that's, being, that's experiencing innovation on the business side, innovation on the marketing side. Okay, so one question that arises with this, this concept of, of innovation for, for green technologies is what the role of government is. And that's a, that's a healthy debate to have. Um, there is one side that, uh, you, it's, it's a spectrum, uh, it, and there's always kind of a, a mix of, of perspectives on this, on this question. But the general issue is that in any kind of um, technology that has a, a, a benefit, a, a broader benefit to society, in this case, we might think of energy access being a benefit, we might think of broader economic growth being a benefit, we might think of less environmental damage being a benefit. If those benefits are not priced by the current market structure, in other words, if there's an, an externality in the, in the economic term, um, we would expect that those kinds of innovations would not be pursued uh, as aggressively as if the externality were already priced in. And this is often the situation we deal with when we're, when we're talking about green technologies or low emissions kinds of technologies, whether it's the small scale technology like that battery, uh, so the battery, solar, and LED flashlight, or whether it's really large scale technologies like carbon capture and storage or um, next generation ethanol, something with sort of big energy. Whether small or big energy, if the externalities aren't priced, we wouldn't expect to get as much innovation uh, on those on those technologies as we would if it were priced. So the question then becomes, if we're not going to change the world in terms of the price of these externalities, which in the near term in some countries, it just may not be feasible in your local, you know, in your local situation in, in the U.S. right now, for example, uh, there's just not the prospect of a pricing system for carbon. So that changes what we have as, as a policy, uh, a set of policy options. Um, but the government can do a lot, uh, even, in, even in the face of not being able to price the externalities. The whole idea is that there is some kind of market failure that provides a rationale of sorts for some kind of policy. Uh, we can talk about uh, what those policies would be in the coming slides. Um, when we think about policy for energy now, now we're thinking at the generally the domestic, you know, national level context. If we're looking at energy policy, the motivations for thinking about energy policy usually have fallen into roughly four 
dimensions, four categories, which I show here in this, in this slide, these interlinked dimensions of energy policy. So we have energy access, making sure that all people in the population have some access to clean or uh, available energy to do the work that they need to do in their lives. Um, energy security, uh, an issue that touches on a lot of you know, government concern about whether there are going to be reliable sources of supply for all the kinds of energy that are used in a national system. That could be fossil, that could be hydro, that could be biofuels, it could be any number of technologies. But the idea of energy security, that, that a country isn't very dependent on other countries, often raises its head in, in terms of energy policy. Um, economic growth is, a, is obviously a key, motiva a key motivation for almost all national governments. How can we encourage economic growth? And that's usually a top-line concern of the government. Energy is often seen as an input to economic growth. That's why energy security is important. That's potentially why environmental impact is important. But economic growth can be seen even more broadly. As I mentioned in my introductory comments, it's possible that energy can be a source of economic growth. Certain countries are pursuing, in fact, industrial and economic policies that are oriented at export markets. Um, and I think here, for example, Korea, uh, and there's many of them, I'd just use one example, but Korea with its green growth strategy, thinking about uh, nuclear, wind, solar as export commodities, not simply uh, something that's focused on just domestic, securing domestic supply. Uh, and I should say before I went on, the fourth one, which uh, is, is also on there, I mentioned environmental damage and, and climate change is a, is, a, is a sort of special case of environmental damage, uh, one that might be seen, it manifests in different ways, but is certainly part of the overall global challenge of tackling energy. Uh, the question then arises, I, I presented four goals, you know, is these four dimensions of energy policy, and the question always arises, well, what's the best approach to, to tackle these? Is it, is it to sort of think about long-term energy strategy, maybe we'll solve the climate change problem later and deal with our economic problems now? That's one way to do it. But I think that the, the most creative and the most uh, sort of likely to hit all of our development and economic goals at one time is to think about doing this four-part approach to achieving the energy goals. Thinking about the linked areas of energy innovation, by which I mean thinking of new and less expensive technologies, new markets, developing new markets, opening new markets, and also thinking about that longer term innovation that I mentioned earlier. Implementation, so taking technologies that we have now on the shelf, figuring out a way to get the policy to encourage those technologies to come off the shelf and into general use. Integration, thinking of not only specific technologies like just wind turbines or thinking of things like batteries or battery electric vehicles um, and smart grids as independent entities, but thinking about how those technologies work with each other. So instead of individual atomistic approach, thinking about, for example, how might intermittent renewables in a future world combine with people's battery electric vehicles and a smart grid to create some kind of distributed storage system in the car batteries of people's vehicles, right? So there's, there's ways to think about integrating new technologies that go beyond the models that we currently use and might in fact enable a different approach to delivering the energy security and the energy services that we want in the future. And the upshot of all of this is that it's possible then with the combination of these three uh, approaches to think about transforming our energy system to one that is less dirty, is more economically sound, is more profitable, and in fact has greater access and benefits to all, uh, all parts of uh, domestic populations. Okay. So developments arise, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, to switch topics now a little bit, and to think about well, what are the different development contexts that, that, that are experiencing changes in the energy supply mix, and how might those different contexts uh, think about these, di these different four dimensions of energy policy approach. Um, very roughly, I mean, we have a number of different contexts, and I, 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 you know, every individual country, in fact, even subnational levels, even states are often quite different in terms of how they, uh, states or municipalities even, are often quite different in terms of their constraints, what their existing energy structure is, what their challenges are, and how, therefore, they might approach it through policy. But very roughly, uh, the, the, the large emerging economies right now have a rapidly growing energy infrastructure. Um, statistic that uh, often comes up is, for example, two-thirds of the buildings that will exist in India in 2030 have yet to be built. And so that provides a great opportunity 
for thinking about what might be done differently, not only from the market and technology perspective, but what might be done differently from a policy perspective. Are there, for example, regulations or standards that aren't stifling, right? That they're not necessarily going to sort of stifle the way that the market is expanding and we want to encourage that kind of growth. But on the other hand, to make sure that if a building is going in, might it be worth spending, you know, half a percent more on the building to gain a great amount of energy savings and therefore cost savings over the 50 to 100 year life of the building. And those kinds of standards and regulations are ones that have proven to work well in the past, and I'll talk about them in, in a few minutes. Um, in the less developed countries, the countries are just starting to kind of enter the emerging stage. Um, one of the priorities is certainly energy access, and, and like I said, here we have in some ways the, the almost a greater opportunity to leapfrog across the idea that we need to kind of build grid distributed electricity and get it out to every people, every person in the population. Because the need is there, the opportunities are now there for just for essentially distributed generation, both of lighting and of energy generation, thinking about things like light, uh, um, microgrids, solar technology, wind technology, yeah, even potentially distributed biofuels, depending on how they're, they're deployed, um, might be at least partial answers to the challenges that face um, uh, uh, people in, in a lot of these areas as well. So I'm going to talk about a few technology areas and what, what kinds of policies might be uh, conceivable for those. We'll talk about efficiency, renewables, fuel switching, and a few others. So let me highlight efficiency first. Um, I talked about the, the buildings in India as a, as a kind of motivator for this. Um, but basically the idea is that most of the l very low cost interventions that can be done around the world today are in efficiency. Whether it's using less energy to make photons for light, using less energy to make heat or cooling for buildings, uh, using less energy for people to get, uh, to, to, um, uh, get themselves from point A to point B. Uh, all of these elements generally have relatively inexpensive efficiency measures that can be implemented. And there is a role for policy here. If policy is there, if policy is encouraging a sort of basic minimum standard, for example, in the amount of electricity required to you know, run a, a, a sort of a refrigerator or an air conditioning unit or a heating unit, um, these kinds of things provide a consistent market for people who are doing the innovation, who are taking those technologies off the shelf and proposing to put them in, in, in general use. So efficiency is one uh, key area to look at. Renewables is another area that we often think of with the idea of green energy. It's often, uh, often usually thought of first when we think about uh, green electricity, so something like a wind turbine or a solar photovoltaic cell, uh, something like this. There are policies that can encourage renewables, and it's important, of course, to be aware of what the relative benefits and costs are of the renewables in every individual context. Clearly, the resource is going to be different in every country, in every sort of specific uh, location. In other words, how much sun or wind there might be there. But there's a lot of other dimensions of uh, what goes into a cost decision. Certainly, the renewables have an environmental benefit relative to dirtier fossil fuels, clearly compared to coal, for example. Um, so policy may wish to encourage renewables just for those reasons. But there might be other ways that renewables can be helpful. For ex the one that the example I gave before, places that are off-grid, off the electricity grid in rural areas of, of the world, sometimes Putting renewables there can be uh, a lot less expensive than building out new copper wires to provide energy services there. So policies can encourage that uh, from, from, in specific circumstances. Uh, the next is end-use fuel switching. The idea here is that um, sometimes people use certain fuels for cooking, for heating, uh, in, in, the, in the residential context. Sometimes industries use certain fuels for running their operations or the electricity system might use certain fuels for generating electricity. It is often the case if you're talking about, you know, for example, even two different fossil fuels like coal and gas, the environmental impact of natural gas tends to be much lower than it is for coal. So it's possible that switching fuels from one to the other provides an opportunity for a lower environmental impact at uh, maybe similar cost or it, depending on the, the prevailing rates, uh, possibly even a lower cost. Um, power generation efficiency. So it is also possible to think about uh, improving the efficiency in different uh, power in the power generation sector. Even if we're talking about coal, um, this is an area that you know I, you know, we're talking about low emissions development, and um, it is true that many countries have 
a large endowment of coal resource. And it is also true uh, that many of those countries are going to be expanding their use of that domestic resource. They do it for reasons relating to energy security, to the fact that the electricity or the energy is available and, and the technology is ready. Um, there may be discussions over the coming years about what the right rate of build out for the coal infrastructure is globally. And that may have some implications for near term and even longer term decisions on coal fired power. But the reality is that there will be more coal fired power going in. One of the ways to address that is to think about, well, look, if we're going to burn uh, so many tons of coal per day, why don't we just, why don't we ensure that we get more usable electricity from the coal that we're using? So in improving plant efficiency from 25, 35% up to 40, 45% is feasible with in more advanced technologies. Government policy can absolutely encourage this kind of transition. It may not be where we want the energy system to be in 100 years, uh, but for the near term, thinking about more efficiency in the existing power uh, supply system could be a very helpful way to encourage development to increase energy supply while reducing the level of emissions from the infrastructure. And finally, and here I return to the flex fuel vehicle example, uh, here we have a picture of uh, President Lula, uh, former President Lula from Brazil, um, in his flex fuel vehicle, uh, the, the uh, VW Gol, the first flex fuel vehicle introduced uh, in Brazil. Um, new technologies can be introduced, and these are really where we're talking if we're thinking about a 20 to 30 year timeline for an energy transition, a transformation of how we get our energy over time. Clearly, the new technologies are essential to doing that. The new technologies, in this case, the example that I'm providing here, is an, is an old technology that's just been reintroduced for a new context. So Brazil was able to introduce this. As I said, over 90% of their vehicles are now flex fuel vehicles in the span of seven or eight years. Uh, so it was a very fast changeover. The technologies existed since the early 20th century, but Brazil has given it the right, um, the right matrix, the right sort of the seeds fell on the fertile soil. And so it was able to, to sort of blossom and grow very quickly. Um, and now we've got a mundane technology that's been uh, transformational in that country. Um, in, in addition to the, re the mundane technologies, we can imagine that the advanced technologies might be something we would see more of in the future. Those integrated systems that I mentioned before of battery vehicles, maybe even their self-driving bat battery vehicles, right? I mean, you, this is where we can think about the excitement of future technologies and how do we encourage the innovations today that will lead us to the technologies in 2030 that will be important to the people who live in our own countries? And, and I think that's where we get to this question of innovation policy. So when we think about policy to, to support innovation, uh, one of the key areas I, I mentioned before when I, I, I used the flex fuel vehicle example of President Lula's picture, um, that a new technology has to enter with a policy matrix that is supportive. It's, it's fine to be innovating and doing basic research, um, but if a new technology comes out and there's no market for it, if there's no, you know, if it's, it's something that it just ends up costing slightly more or even substantially more than existing technologies, the free market will not pick that technology up. That's a policy decision. Now, sometimes people want to encourage the free market to, to, to operate. Other times we make decisions that the free market is not providing all of the aspects that we need. This is why national defense exists, right? The free market does not provide for all uh, elements that we want out of a national system. So there's a possibility that if the, the leaders of a country uh, in consultation with the stakeholders in the country think that there might be a role for new technologies or transformation of energy, you can look to different policy options. But it's important to do to look at a suite of policy options so that new technologies don't come out and then just wither on the vine. There has to be some support, a clear, credible, and long-term support from the government for these kinds of policies to make basically be worth the investment. So here I've listed five different categories. And I show at the top, you see innovation, but regulation and standards for current technologies going in today price instruments to affect the, the essentially the market operations or what costs more than, you know, uh, some technologies may cost more than others and might there be some ways to encourage via tax on things that we don't like or via subsidies on the things that we do like, uh, some way to change uh, the market decision making in that area. Quantity instruments, uh, for example, the cap and trade system that the European Union uses to govern its uh, CO2 emissions is an example of a, of a quantity instrument. 
And then finally, international cooperation, which, by the way, can subsume all of these others, but in some ways operates a little bit differently because of the legal character of international cooperation not being quite the same as, as parliamentary or presidential action at the national level. So we're going to focus on innovation uh, primarily for the rest of the seminar, but I wanted to make the point that it's not worth doing an innovation policy if you're not thinking about uh, all the rest of these, because again, they, we, uh, the, the, the success, the eventual success of the investment in the innovation policies depends on having all of these other elements. Okay, so in, when we're thinking about innovation, there's a couple of dimensions that, that scholars in the field of innovation uh, like to point out. And I should say, even uh, where I sit at the World Bank today, there's a scholar, Mark Dutz, who does a lot of work on innovation and intellectual property, for example. Um, so there's, there's a number of dimensions of innovation, not all of which are just focused on green growth or green energy like we are today, but are actually uh, relevant across the wide spectrum of encouraging technological in innovation, entrepreneurial capacity in the domestic context. So here I'll talk about a few. Uh, you can see a number of boxes there. Um, policy instruments that, that address innovation do usually one or more, address one or more of these aspects. Thinking about, as I said before, what's called frontier innovation. The innovation that happens at the very edge of, uh, uh, of, of, of the possibilities, right? So these are the very advanced technologies, often tend to be higher cost, often require a well-developed de um, research and development infrastructure in, in, in a country, such as universities or national labs. Uh, as well as a number of, uh, you know, human capital, like the, the capacity of experts and researchers uh, to be working on, on, on the questions. Um, adaptive innovation, this is the idea of uh, repackaging or being able as an entrepreneur to look at technologies that already exist out in the world. Maybe they exist in another country context, maybe somebody else has it invented them somewhere else, but we have an idea to repackage them for the market that we know in our own national or even municipal context. That's adaptive innovation, and there are ways that those kinds of uh, decisions can be encouraged through policy, encouraging risk-taking, encouraging a, a, a sort of uh, healthy market for the people that do those kinds of, um, to want to bring those kinds of products to market. Improving absorptive capacity, the ability of, uh, of a system to take on new, new technologies. That might be through just regulations. And then it's always useful to pursue possibilities for international collaboration. Sometimes it, 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 it is a lot of work for not a lot of benefit, but sometimes international collaboration can be a, a very good way to build expertise quickly, to expose people to new networks and new ideas, and that might be a way that um, uh, new innovations can come to fruition in the local area. Okay, so here we'll, I want to sort of focus on a couple of specific, more specific kinds of ideas. Um, First, to look at public funding to labs and universities. Now, not every country or, or state will have the ability to do this, but there are certainly places that have been pursuing it increasingly. Um, a lot of uh, countries have pursued funding to labs and universities. The idea here is, of course, that uh, there is some basic research capacity in a country. Well, having this basic research, you're going to have scientists, you're going to have researchers who may end up spinning off ideas into the private sector, maybe identifying um, a, a region or a resource that they understand and being able to do that, that repackaging kind of innovation. So supporting basic research is, is one element that, that is always sort of listed as an important component uh, with the understanding that not all places can do a full sort of set of funding. And this is where international collaboration might be uh, of, of great interest. Some people, for example, have proposed um, doing regional science foundations that provide competitive grants that are funded essentially externally but that flow to the research labs or the universities in individual countries in much the same way that, for example, uh, the European um, Research Councils or the U.S. National Science Foundation funds only at the domestic level. So ideas that are worth uh, pursuing and thinking about. Um, the, the, the bottom line is that the new technologies may require a lot of new innovation. And the, uh, there's an estimate here of uh, nearly $1 trillion period for the International Energy Agency. Things might be up to $1 trillion uh, per year in terms of new uh, technology investment. Uh, research grants are another dimension of this. Um, specific, instead of just base funding for the universities, this might be competitive funding for specific kinds of proposals. And there's a lot of scope for the, the uh, 
not just the advanced research, like you might see with base funding of universities, but even something like uh, policies that are going to market in, in the near term, uh, or certain, uh, technologies that are going to market in the near term. Another element is to do tax credits, and this is something that particularly helps entrepreneurs and companies who are trying to do energy research and bring products to market. Thinking of national research infrastructure, not just the universities, but also scientific labs, uh, and also in potentially non-affiliated, non-governmental sort of uh, research institutions, perhaps in uh, private sector entities. And then finally, and finally, um, to, to, to add in here that there is a, a kind of different phasing of the innovation chain where sometimes we have early stage technologies and it eventually the hope is that many of these technologies will be sufficient, self-sufficient on their own in the market. And in order to get from here to there, a lot of times companies need to go through this um, so-called, as you see here, so the valley of death is, a, is an ominous sounding name, but basically it's the time between the point where the technology is proven in the lab and where it actually becomes commercialized. Um, though that period is often very vulnerable for companies. Sometimes if there's a very well-developed uh, capital market system in a country, the capital can go to those companies so they can build the factory they need to build. But in other times, in other contexts, sometimes that capital isn't available. So this is an area where the multilateral agencies, bilateral funding, even national systems of uh, loan guarantees can help with companies that are transitioning from the inter interesting, innovative idea to the to the market uh, to the market mechanism. There's a, this is uh, just sort of thinking about base of the pyramid or bottom of the pyramid innovation for low emissions development. And all I've done here is pre presented a few uh, ideas for for kind of contemplation, um, special support to SMEs, thinking about prizes, for example, thinking about government funded R and D training. There are a lot of approaches. I put some references in at the end of the talk, and in the interest of time, I think I'm going to need to skip forward a little bit, uh, one or two slides. But I encourage you to look at the references at the end uh, for promoting low emissions development uh, at, at different levels. And so one thing I wanted to mention, too, is there's a role for both domestic and international policy here. There's a lot of support that can go directly, uh, especially at the domestic level. Okay, that's great. Uh, five minutes, and we're, we're right on target for that. Um, but here you see domestic and international policy approaches. You have applied research networks. So again, that idea of bringing entrepreneurs in contact with other entrepreneurs, with funders, with financiers, and making sure that the, the access to capital is there. Um, there's a lot of, uh, this is a laundry list of options, and I won't go through all of it. And again, I'll refer you to some of the references at the end uh, for that. Um, the idea here is that what you want to do is foster an innovation ecosystem in individual countries that spans all of these dimensions, and you see from left to right there, uh, from research to development, to demonstration, to market formation, and finally to diffusion out into the, into the world. Policy can target any of these dimensions, and so it's important not only to look at the dimensions of the innovation chain, but that also the rest of that innovation architecture that surrounds it. Okay, so thinking about the skills of your uh, of, of, of the domestic um, uh, workers, thinking about the macroeconomic environment, thinking, of course, about natural world and institutions that are in the, co in the country to encourage, again, risk-taking and um, uh, innovation that way. Okay. So we have four different dimensions here that I wanted to highlight in, in conclusion, uh, looking at regulations, so specific kinds of regulations for these, uh, to address these market failures, feed-in tariffs for renewables, uh, emissions trading, uh, tax credits for new technologies, and then other kinds of government rules. Second area is looking at financial infrastructure. Uh, looking at the business environment is very, very important. Thinking about the governance of, of businesses, thinking about the regulation and permitting for new businesses, improving the bureaucratic climate and the regulations uh, around economic transactions, uh, and then, of course, just general licensing and entrepreneurial activity. Public procurement, in other words, the government making commitments to buy products uh, off, off the conveyor belt from, from new firms has proven to be a, a fairly important uh, uh, policy in many country contexts before. It helps co give companies a kind of guarantee that they're going to be able to find a market in the early stage and that it might be able to kind of give them a leg to build their, their technology to pay back some of their early loans and, and build out their, their capacity that way. And then finally, thinking about standards, whether it's minimum standards, zoning, 
building efficiency standards, or even standards of quality, such as the Energy Star program here. Many other countries have a standard of quality, like a gold star kind of program for new appliances or new technologies. All of those serve to provide information in the marketplace and again, help uh, build out the efficiency of a, of, a, of a country's infrastructure with relatively little cost. Okay. Um, and with this, I'm, I'm, I'm basically looking at specific national versus international approaches to build out uh, the R, D, D, and uh, D elements, elements of, of the innovation and architecture. Um, the national level policies are probably going to be the ones that bite the most, that have the most direct influence. But I think it's important for people in the national level to remain engaged with some of these international discussions that are going on. Not only because there's access to finance, but also because there often is internet interesting uh, policy that is, that is being implemented in other places and it's helpful to be uh, paying attention to what other countries are doing. Okay. This is an overly complicated figure that I'm going to just refer you to the, uh, to the uh, to references if, if, you, if you wish. But this is one conception of how, remember at the beginning I said innovation happens, but it has to happen in the wider context. So this is one more holistic way of thinking about innovation, thinking about encouraging different dimensions of the innovation chain simultaneously. So thinking on the left, you see regional science foundations that's building out, say, for example, domestic uh, science and technology capacity, thinking about then business, thinking about the entrepreneurial culture and nurturing that via, for example, business incubators. And then finally, a more familiar approach, thinking about de-risking investment. This might be something that the World Bank would do uh, or something that might be done on a bilateral basis. So in conclusion, uh, it's, it's important to remember that uh, these transformative innovations that may not be happening all from, you know, the kind of high developed country, very high tech labs, right? The transformative innovations may be the ones that are essentially repackaged existing innovations that are going to a completely new market, a market that's only understood by people who, for example, live in the area that they're, that they're working in. And it's very important, it's essential for this 20 to 30 year timeline to think about how those innovations can go from the kind of entrepreneur's concept to expand into this new market. And it's the role of governments around the world to think about their own context, their own development context, what is missing from their development context. Is it, regulated? Is it the regulatory environment? Is it the IP environment? Is it the lack or presence of standards? Or is it other kinds of national priorities that are just articulated out into the country that can encourage these kinds of innovations to spread more widely and be nurtured in the domestic context? Uh, with that, I just have some further readings in the presentation that you can refer to. Uh, I'd like to, uh, and I guess that's, and, and that's it. So you have my contact information, and at this point, I think we have a couple of questions uh, that we will ask of you participants. Uh, after the questions to the participants, I will then take questions that you all can type into your interface, and I'll try to answer as many of those as I can in the remaining time we have. Um, so the first question that uh, should be uh, appearing on your screens is um, just a kind of open conversation. This is just to get our, our, our uh, creative juices flowing. What do you think are some of the main barriers, uh, maybe thinking of your own context, that complicate uh, the application uh, of the uptakes of new technologies? And I've given a number of different uh, uh, possibilities here. Uh, there's no one right answer. Uh, so it's just sort of thinking about, in your context, what might be the most, the, the greatest challenge? And we'll see where, where people come out. Is it bureaucratic climate and regulations? Uh, concerning economic transactions, uh, perhaps long licensing procedures for entrepreneurs before they start businesses. Is it low consumer awareness? So is, a, is it just that people, when they go to, a, go to a shop, they don't distinguish between two different products based on their environmental impact, their energy use, even if it may be lower cost to themselves in the long run, they may not be aware of the, the different impacts of different choices. Or is it just the, the basic reality of early stage production costs that, that are difficult for entrepreneurs to overcome? I'll give you a few seconds to, to look at those and, and enter your answers. Yeah, we have to that. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Thank you. Okay, so. Um, I can see here, uh, the, uh, just, I mean, I'm sure you're all curious, but uh, I was very curious. So uh, of, the, of the people participating, roughly 40% of you um, said it was bureaucratic climate in your countries that, that are in your, in your locations that, that is the dominant factor here. Um, 
uh, about 3% mentioned uh, licensing procedures, about 6% uh, said low consumer awareness, and about half of people said early stage production costs. Um, so, so I think that's, that's interesting, and, and I, one of the messages I want to uh, convey here is that it's very hard to kind of come up here and give a one-size-fits-all answer. It's just, it's very contingent on what's going on in the individual country context. But the, 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 the message I want to get across is that there are many options. Some of them are, are tried and true, and they, they can be very effective. And so it's really a question of mapping what the need is at the country to what the policy levers might be. So maybe we can move on to the next question here. Next question, um, again, a sort of open, just open question. Do you think that the removal of trade barriers, so something about thinking about the international trade flow and technologies, can be an important policy objective for domestic innovation? So there's, there are differing opinions on this, but uh, we'll be curious to see what the participants think. Number one is yes, uh, there's a lot of technology in imported goods, machinery, and equipment, and they're therefore lowering uh, barriers to trade might facilitate uh, technological innovation, even in the local context, even in, in domestic context. And the other is no innovation um, really cannot be created through I imitating other goods, and it's really good to, to encourage that to happen at the domestic level via, via policies that in, in sort of favor, arguably, domestic uh, industries. Not sure is another possibility. Okay, so uh, I think everybody's probably voted now. We have uh, 20, uh, sorry, 63%, so slightly over half, um, so almost two-thirds of people saying that lowering barriers to trade is important. Uh, and then I think, interestingly, roughly a fifth of people, roughly 20%, saying sometimes innovation can be fostered if it's essentially protected in the early stage. And, and I think the reality looking around the world is that different countries have taken different policies on that and that we have examples of both succeeding. Now, it's definitely true that the, uh, protecting a domestic industry uh, is increasingly difficult, especially if, if countries are, are seeking to enter the trade regime, uh, the international trade regime. But it has, it has been pursued in the past. And in fact, to some degree, the example that I gave of Brazil earlier was to some degree related to a, a sort of very strong domestic policy on ethanol production there starting in the 70s. OK, let's move on to the next question. What policies do you think are important for stimulating entrepreneurship and enhancing absorptive capacity of firms and countries? Now, of course, uh, these kinds of questions are, are tough. Probably all of them are important. But let's see where you're, you're sort of, in your context, what you think would be most important. Making it easier and cheaper to abandon failed businesses. It's a, an issue in some, in some places, certainly. Um, Increasing government revenues through tax policy, and I, I should say it's not revenue-driven necessarily, but perhaps something that would address that market failure that I mentioned earlier, for uh, market failure of emissions or market failure of uh, green, you know, not producing enough uh, energy security, or uh, government targeting of specific sectors and technologies to ensure their commercialization. I mentioned the example earlier of Korea and its green growth policy targeting specific sectors of the economy they wanted to encourage. Um, and, and, and that would sort of fall into that category. Okay, I think all the votes are in. Uh, looks like we have um, about 10% of people looking at, um, you know, that business, the business climate, making it easier to essentially go bankrupt, start over again, uh, being an important element. And I would, I would agree with that, that it's in places that don't have it, that's, that's a, an essential uh, side of the entrepreneurial dimension. Uh, increasing government revenues through taxes, not many people like that. That was 3% of you. And then um, government targeting of specific sectors and technologies, nearly 90% of the participants uh, weighed in on that. So that was a, a clear, um, in terms of the people on the seminar today, that, that was an interesting uh, outcome. Okay, and then I think we have one more question uh, in the official, or is it just three? Yeah. Just three, because yeah. we have just three questions. We've got about 10 minutes. And then we have 10 minutes for open Q&A. Actually, so. we've got, we repeat a whole bunch of questions. Yes, okay. Uh, okay. Sure you can answer the ones you okay. can, and the rest we can So, with your, um, we we have, and, and thank you all of you for for sending in this. There's at least 21 questions I have here. No, no doubt I I, I can't answer all of them, but I appreciate your uh, your your great interest in the topic. I'm very pleased and excited to see that. Um, so let me just take a moment and look through these, and I'll try to pick out a few that we can talk about as a group. Um, and I think there might even be a way to continue to ask questions uh, offline. Um, let's see. Um, let me, I'm just going to scan through these here. Uh, 
I'm seeing a lot of uh, questions about, um, interestingly, adaptation uh, to climate change here, and I'll, I'll try to answer. I'll try to mention uh, one dimension of that in my uh, in my answers. Um, um, okay, so there are a couple of questions on uh, resilience and adaptation. So a lot of the talk uh, today that I was giving was on essentially energy technology in, in, in climate, um, or relating that would be the way that is one dimension of climate. Um, a couple of people asked, how do we think about innovation and low emissions development and how it re re relates to the resilience or the adaptive capacity of individual communities? So this is a, a really interesting area. And it turns out there's a lot of areas where um, increasing the availability of energy services uh, in particular, like I said, the lighting services might enhance educational outcomes. Um, we talked a lot about energy, but to be honest, you know, green innovation can be, you know, much broader than just energy. It can be water, for example. So better use, better ways to use scarce resources like water might be a way that uh, individual communities can can actually stretch their resources uh, further to get more use out of the resource that they have. Ideally, that would make more and healthier water available to the population. Uh, while also reducing the stresses that, that come with water scarcity. So that's that's another dimension, and I probably don't have time to get into a lot of details on that, but it's, it's something um, I think that uh, many people uh, in the development community are interested in, in pursuing. Um, let's see. Um, so what, one of the questions was uh, about sort of thinking about the relationship. I was speak, speaking very specifically about um, individual countries and thinking about their energy policy, thinking about what their sort of from their own sort of domestic concerns, what is driving decision making primarily at the national level and maybe at the state level. Certain places have some like Brazil, for example, there's you know sort of some action at the state level as well as at the federal level. Um, so there's there's a question of sort of what does energy policy look like in terms of priorities and goals uh, from the perspective I was talking about. But there was a, a, a completely, uh, you know, reasonable question of how does this all add up to kind of if we're if we're concerned about something like emissions, uh, greenhouse gas emissions at the global level, you know, how do these innovation policies add up if we're speaking about, for example, China was one of the parts of the question, or the European Union? How do the domestic energy policies add up to something that actually makes a difference at the international level? And the only way to, to answer that is really to say. Um, there's sort of a two-prong effect. One is that countries decide what they decide at the national level. I mean, that's kind of, you know, that's the kind of driver of a lot of what happens, uh, you know, in terms of countries' energy systems. So the EU has a process, a political process, by which they set priorities and they set policies. Um, they're going to pursue that set of priorities and policies, and they're going to have a sort of consequent uh, energy system. China has another, a different political system by which they pursue their policies and uh, priorities. China has actually set quite a, you know, on a number of dimensions, quite aggressive targets for uh, renewables, for example, for low carbon energy, and for their own development goals. So they're pursuing it in their own way. Now they have a, you know, there's there's a you know, certainly a build out of coal happening in, in both places, um, and and so one of the questions is how does the international community sort of discuss uh, those those priorities with China and and the European Union? And the answer is that. This is where the international discussion can be important. It can be important by identifying what countries are doing more, what countries are doing less, and giving examples uh, for low emissions development that might be the, uh, taken up across borders. Okay. Uh, I probably have time for a couple more questions. Um, do we have any new questions coming in that I should uh, answer? Otherwise, I've got one or two more here. Okay, so I see it on the side here. Yeah, no, I can see. Uh, I'm, I'm trying. I, I'm, I'm not. I see there's a very healthy discussion going on in the sidebar here, which I appreciate. And I, I'm. Um, I might. Uh, there you go. I can see that now. Um, let's see here. I'm going to scan down a little bit. You might. You might want to tell them that later. You know, we'll provide you these. And if you, yes, yes, yes. If you're comfortable with that. Sure, can, sure. And I'll mention it as well. So don't feel pressured that you have to answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's fine. Um, take the ones you. Okay, th thank you. So, so um, the, the question, the, the information is that we can continue to take questions and uh, we can try to, 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 to give answers to those as we can. Um, 
given that, that we only have about five minutes or so left, I'm, I'm just going to highlight a few, uh, one, one or two more additional ones. Um, so here's uh, one of the participants, and, and, and I'm going to sort of, since that's where I'm coming into the sidebar conversation here, thinking about um, rural electrification as a, as a question. And, and I think that's a great one to think about because it, it combines a lot of the elements of the innovation as well as the energy policy goals that I talked about. And here I, I thank um, uh, Xiao Chen for the contribution uh, as well as the others for the, the, the kind of prompts for this, thinking about how do you imagine changing a rural electrification system. So there was a model that we pursued, and I think with much benefit pursued, in terms of bringing electricity out uh, increasingly far into the rural areas uh, around different countries. But there might be these alternative models. One way to think about this, and I'm just going to highlight the, 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 the one here in the, in the sidebar, is thinking about bringing in, if, if a country has the interest in, in um, encouraging a carbon finance system, and so here's where we get the possibility, for example, of international programs, such as the Clean Development Mechanism under the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, can provide a slight you know, additional rate of return on projects that, that lead to a lower emissions level in a, in a country or a region. And so th that additional carbon finance can help with entrepreneurs who are trying to basically drive a new project. Maybe it's a lower carbon project, something that could be transportation related. It could be switching of lighting. Uh, the CDM is becoming more flexible now. Uh, which is good news, and so it allows these kinds of smaller scale projects, more distributed kind of projects, to actually get access to carbon finance. I think that's a very good option, and, and I thank you for raising it. Thinking about direct subsidies, um, subsidies are dangerous. They're, they're, they're both good and bad, but there are certainly instances where subsidies can be helpful, and tax credits and this kind of thing. The key element there with subsidies is just to ensure that over time, uh, once you create a market, that the government can actually pull back a little bit, so it's not a permanent uh, investment in that new technology. The idea is hopefully to drive down the costs enough so that it can become self-sustaining. Um, thinking about private investment, I think that's also uh, uh, quite healthy, and that would harken back to some of the discussion we had earlier about the business culture uh, and the access to capital. How do we encourage the access to private capital in countries and not have the government crowding out uh, that innovative uh, part of the ecosystem? Thank you very much, um, Dr. Nathan Holtzman, for this very, very timely and interesting presentation. I also want to thank the um, 50 or so participants who have been uh, enriching this um, conversation by a very lively back-channel discussion. Um, so obviously it's a very hot topic uh, with uh, a great pres presenter. Um, what uh, I wanted to mention is all of the resources, uh, including the videos, the PowerPoints, and other documents that Nathan might provide to us will be available on the website uh, that you just see. Uh, of course, the video will be posted in about 48 hours, uh, but the rest of it should be up and about very soon. Um, we also wanted to remind you that uh, we have a set of about uh, 10 e-learning courses uh, on the whole area of climate change. So I would encourage you to look at eInstitute.worldbank.org and go and look at e-courses. We have a calendar out there that um, gives you the dates and descriptions uh, and objectives for each of these courses. A quick reminder that the next uh, webinar, Climate Change Agriculture, Developing agriculture carbon projects um, will be um, available on November 9th at the same time, 9 to 10 Eastern. So we look forward to seeing you at the, at the next webinar, but in the meantime, uh, we ask that you take um, two minutes to respond to the questions that will be displayed next. Thank you.